we're here today with Mr. Jacques D'Amboise, choreographer, former principal dancer with New York City Ballet, and director of the most joyful dance school on the planet, the National Dance Institute in New York City. He will be recognized this evening for his lifetime achievement in dance as part of the 16th annual choreography festival here at the McCallum Theater in Palm Desert, California. Welcome to California. Hey, that's what they say all the time. <laughs> Hey, that's down south, right? <laughs> they say hey for everything. And every time I'm listening to public radio, and in the interview is, and the interviewer said, well, Mr. Makowitz, your book is wonderful. Thanks for being on our show. And the person who's interviewed always says, thanks for having me. And I always think, how? <laughs> or d'oeuvres <laughs> in bed. Why do they say that? They all say it. Thanks for having me. Why don't they just say, hey? <laughs> so after we finish the interview, and you'll say, oh, well, thanks for having this interview. I'll say, hey. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're warned, forewarned. I was, uh, I was just looking at the photos of the most recent uh, NDI concert at uh, Symphony Space, and... Uh, they're this was incredibly comfortable, yeah, recently, yeah, last yeah. couple of weeks ago. And uh, the enthusiasm for dance just pours off of those pictures. So I was going to ask you, I, I wonder what gave you the idea to move outside the world of ballet for starting the Dance Institute when, when, people, when you began? If you, you, Stephen, or anybody, ask yourself as you go through life and you find yourself doing something, ask yourself... Who were my early teachers? Who, they were the ones, and your parents, and the environment of those early days, but mostly those early teachers, and also peers. They wrote the scripts that you're acting out in your life. If you think back about it. So I think back on why did I become a dancer? Why did it, and I see those forces, those early, early teaching, and and being with such superb people in the world of dance and being taught by them, cared about by them, choreographed by them, challenged by them. It was from the first time I performed was uh, seven, eight years old. Balancing choreographed, I was parking Midsummer Night's Dream. <laughs> I wasn't yet, I was still eight, it was June, July, early July. And he was doing for a very wealthy man who had told Lincoln Kirstein, who was the head of the wealthy man that was supporting the ballet, he said, I have a summer garden that has an outdoor stage. It would be wonderful to have a little, maybe Mr. Balanchine could choreograph a little summer dance for us. So Balanchine did a little excerpt of Midsummer Night's Dream, Mendelssohn. I was pucked and there were four nymphs, and it was just a tiny little dance. I can remember the steps. My mother made me an itchy costume as a fawn. It was itchy wool. And, <laughs> and I got $10 for three performances. <laughs> and my father was making $35 a week for six, 10 hours a day, six days a week. I came home with that $10. And so that was very seductive to be with four beautiful nymphs who were uh, 12, and I, I, was, I was eight or nine. No, I wasn't even yet eight. And there was Tanakila Claire who was 12, and Joan Jurup, and these beautiful dancers with me, little girls, but to me they were wonderful beauties. And, and then get paid for it. <laughs> right? So very seductive. So I got into performing very early, I dropped out of high school. This is kind of amusing. I have about 11 honorary doctorates. I was dean of the State University of New York for two years, a full professor. I was visiting professor in Santa Barbara, California, Santa Barbara, at uh, College of Creative Studies for almost 11 years. National Education Award, Duke University, Nancy Hanks Scholarship Award, so on and so on. All this stuff in education. I have one year of high school. Now, and yet, and I am not educated. I'm 
I'm not educated, but I am learned. Yeah. And I'm learned because of two things. Will travel with world-class people with a natural bent towards curiosity, but most of all reading. Reading, reading, reading. I'm never without a book. Right now I've discovered Lee Childs, who's one of the best writers of thrillers ever. He's <laughs> beyond belief brilliant, right? And from, from that to the essays of Montaigne, to what's the history of Confucius, to uh, the Inquisition and the witchcraft. And, I mean, it, everything... You can read Marcus Aurelius and become friends with the Caesar from 3,000 years ago. And you feel like you know him. Reading is the single most important thing there is for every child. That it opens up literature, poetry, everything. The other important things is dance and music and drawing, right. the arts. To be involved in them and not... By the way, I'm talking without stop. And I'm not quite answering the question. But there's... A couple of words I hate. One is kids. Mm. Hey, come on, they're kids. Don't worry about them. No, they're children. You would never say, hey, come on, they're children. Don't worry about them. You, right? right? The kids yeah. are frivolous. Children are profound. And the other word is fun. Hey, we're going to have fun. No, we're going to have joy. The same balance. Fun is frivolous. Joy is profound. And those are two words. Now, the one that really grabs me is education. Hmm. Schools of education. It sounds like you go there like to have injections put in your brain, <laughs> right? Now you're going <laughs> to learn math. They should be schools of learning. When did you finish your learning? What do you mean? I'm still learning. When did you finish your education? Oh, well, I finished college or I, I got a master's in it, right? See how limiting it is to use that yes. word? There should be boards of learning. Yes. Boards of learning, places of learning, schools of learning, homes of learning, citadels of learning, right? not universities. Right. Right? So I can see when, from your telling me that story about doing Puck in the Garden, why when you did that um, little documentary with the, those uh, five teenage dancers. Why oh, you, you took them that. out into the woods and, and had them come yes. dancing through yes. the trees. That's yes, like but I... what happened there? <laughs> Lynn Arison and her husband, he's gone, Ted. But they established an organization, Young Arts, advancements of children who want to have a professional career in any field of the arts, filmmaking, whatever. And uh, they asked me, down there, uh, I think what happened was they, they gave an award. I think Quincy Jones was the first, I was the second, I know Placero Domingo, Frank Gehry, really in different fields. And uh, they were filmed by this, when you're down there in Miami, it's in Miami and it's usually January, February time of year, uh, these young winners of this award come together and they really get master classes and hang out and perform and it's really great. So Lynn, uh, anyway, she's established this thing and they decided uh, how could they do with this film crew, which were terrific, take the winners, right? Uh, uh, Bill T. Jones, I think, right? And see, have them teach a master class. It's boring and uninteresting to me because it's easy. I can do it anywhere, yeah. anytime. That's what you do every day. I anyhow. needed to challenge myself. So I thought, how can I challenge myself? If I have to do a master class, I'm going to say it's going to be 50 minutes with, or an hour, 50 minutes, really 50 minutes. Okay, I'm going to choreograph, I'm giving myself in 50 minutes to take five people to do a five minute dance and I don't want to meet the people till I see them walk in the room. But I'd like to have three boys and two girls or three girls and two boys. I don't care. 
send me whoever you pick from Young Arts. I don't know who picked them, right? So these five people came. Now I gave myself 50 minutes, really, five hours. No, I gave myself five hours to make a dance that would be five minutes by, with five people, but there was no music. It didn't exist. I had to write the music. Well, I'm not going to score it. I had Neil Kirkwood, I think, and Kay Gaynor in case I wanted voice. So in it you'll hear um ba ba la ba ba, this girl singing, right? Mm -hmm. I decided yeah. we need some voice and it should sound a little bizarre and a little threatening and yet have a rhythm. Um ba ba la, right? Um ba ba la ba ba, right? And I think I heard that sung in an African chant somewhere, <laughs> right? In Haiti or something. Anyway, so I invented that dance and do you know we finished it? <laughs> in five hours but I we finished the last step and it was bing five hours but we hadn't run it all the way through from beginning to end but this step this step this step ten. we put it together and then we need the last step and then we did the last step and it was time and I said but we have to run it unbroken right so we went over five minutes to do it unbroken but basically it was choreographed in five hours with f and the music written at the same time. Now, it's no good, Stephen, if you sit and practice, what instrument are you? I play the violin. Okay, you practice, you're a young person and you practice all day on a beautiful piece of violin, a sonata or whatever. And now after a whole year of practice, you're gonna go in a closet close the door and play it. No, you have to have that public performance where you publicly exhibit the excellence you have achieved. It can be family after dinner one night. It can be an auditorium. It can be after the church service where whoever's hanging around, you go up and you play, whatever. But you need to have that public expression because it's the performing arts. Right. And so I needed, I had finished it but it needed performance. And National Dance Institute was at Jacob Pillar. So I asked them to come together. So it, I had they finished, and then a month or so later, they all came together, and I staged it for the big space, and they filmed it. And the next day, we were performing in a space almost the size of this little dressing room. Where it was more interesting because creativity occurs by establishing limits, right? right. Write a story, yeah. then you'll say, well, how many words? First limit, who's gonna read it, right? Eventually you'll say, are you paying me anything, <laughs> right? But, and then you'll say, what's the subject? And they'll say anything you want. Now you have to go edit yourself. I'm gonna write about one person on a bus. Now, see how you limit, 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 and it makes you creative. Mm -hmm. Right, wait a minute, let's add more. The person's handicap. Right. <laughs> what kind of handicap? Autism. So he goes past his bus stop. Right. And at the end of the trip, the bus driver turns around and there's this Stephen, young Stephen, sitting there, right? I mean, right? Mm -hmm. And maybe that's how you end it. <laughs> the bus driver and says, are you getting off here? And the kids, I don't know. End. Right? right? Yeah. Now, I invented that just now. I didn't think of it before. I gave, I forced myself to have a limit. Right? And can, can I stay in 300 words? That's hard. That's really hard. Right? And so limits make creativity. I was able to be creative in that. But I wanted more in that piece, Stephen. I wanted the children to participate, the young teenagers to participate. So I'd say, I need a turning step right here. Invent one. Too late, you lost your turn. Invent <laughs> one. Right? Then I'd say, good, do you want to do it to the right or left? Oh, you want to do it to the right. Do you want to do it once? What would happen if you did it facing, second time to the back, second time here, third time? Oh, it would be better if you started so that you would end the fourth 
north, south, east, and west. If you started east, south, west, and north, because north is where the audience is. Rather than doing north, south, east, and west, you end up <laughs> facing the wrong direction. So, right? So all that would come out of that rehearsal. That's the way that came. I was very happy with it. I was very happy with it, and I was especially glad to see how the limits of not having a doorway in a small space made the dance better. Yeah, it was a very interesting film, all of it. The, I don't the know traveling around and the, new, the different venues. And right, we get on end. and they went to my place in the Catskills. Yeah. And that's where I thought, wouldn't it be wonderful to see them flitting through the, all the pines that were lined up, rows of pines, to see them flitting. And you know, one of the girls didn't want to do it because she was afraid there were bugs. <laughs> and when she had to lay down or walk in it, she because she was a city, city girl, girl. Yeah. Yeah. that had never been to the country. That's really cute. Right? That's <laughs> yeah. But they were, I don't know what happened to him, but the younger boy had a lot of talent in terms of directing and choreographing. There were the younger of the, of the boys there. Uh, there was something about him, and I think he went on maybe to have his own dance company. Or, uh -huh. he, they, we'll, we haven't not heard from him.